So my name is Morten Grötli, and if you look at my name, you'll see I'm not Swedish. I'm from Norway. So that's explain the funny accent I have. Uh, I'm a professor in medicinal chemistry, and and the idea with this talk was to give you some ideas about how we develop antibiotics. We're going to look at some well-known antibiotics that we use today, and we're going to look a little bit into the crystal ball to see how the future looks too, and some of the problems associated with this. But first, we have to say, since I'm a medicinal chemist, then, what is a medicinal chemist? So I. I picked up this short sort of uh, definition, what it really is. And while you're looking at that, you can think that this does not only point towards the synthesis of compounds. It could be things we isolate from nature. But the thing is, we want to have bioactive compounds. And then we want to develop them into something that can be used to treat diseases. And in this case, antibiotics, we can treat bacteria infections. However, this goes for absolutely all drugs that you take orally. If you look at this slide, it basically shows that uh, you take the drug, maybe as a tablet, you swallow it, it goes down to your stomach, or it continues all the way into the intestines. But from both the stomach and the intestines, we have what we call absorption. That means that it takes the drug from the stomach or the intestines into the bloodstream, indicated by this tube here. So imagine this is your, your uh, blood vessels. Then everything that passes through the blood vessels is filtered to the liver. And in the liver, we have something called metabolism. And if you think, what is that? Well, it basically means that when the body faces compounds that it doesn't like being there, in the liver, we put on things that makes it really water-soluble so we can pee it out. That's the simple definition of metabolism. And uh, when they are metabolized, they travel usually to the kidney, and where we have the excretion, which means urine, we pee it out. Now, this travel here is super important because when you take an antibiotic, you take it as a tablet normally, it's distributed in your whole body. And it means that it's the blood that is the transport, transportation system that brings it around in the body. If we focus a little bit on what's going on in the stomach or the intestines, we will have this what we call absorption. And on this illustration, if you imagine this here is the cell membrane you have in your stomach or intestines. And these uh, circles, triangles, and squares are molecules that we want to bring into the bloodstream. Now, how do they travel from the stomach and intestines into the blood? Well, if we make it simple, we say we usually have three types of mechanism for that. It's something called passive diffusion. It just goes by itself. We have something called facilitated diffusion, which means that there are some proteins that helps the molecules to go across the membrane. And we have what we call active transport, which means there are proteins that use energy, ATP, to pull them over. There are some other variants too, but these are the three main things. And these two are called passive. This is active transport. And that's super important. If that doesn't happen, the drug will not be distributed in your body. It won't find its target, in this case, bacteria. This slide here is to, to illustrate another important point. If the blood is your transportation system, what sort of properties does the molecule have to, to, or what does it need to have in order to like to be in blood? And if you think about it, blood is roughly water with some proteins, meaning if a drug is not soluble in blood, water, it won't be transported. I illustrate that with just looking at the sugar molecule. This is glucose. And each of these dotted lines means that it binds to water. 
So water solubilizes this drug and makes sure it get transported. Now, glucose is just not a drug, it's just sugar. But imagine that this can also be an antibiotic. This sort of property that it's soluble in water or in blood is very important. Otherwise, no transportation occurs. Then you then think about that and say, hmm, it has to be water soluble. If I go back then and say, if I cross the cell membrane, that's lipids. That's very basically just fat. So it means that the compound that's going to be absorbed and transported had to have some lipophilicity to travel across the cell membrane. But it also needs to be soluble in water, otherwise no transportation. So basically, if you summarize that, then we can say that uh, if we have compounds that are lipophilic, they will sure cross the cell membrane very efficiently, but they might not be soluble enough to have efficient transportation. And if we have something that is really water soluble, it usually becomes too polar to actually travel efficiently over the cell membrane. So it has to be balanced. We have to think about both things when we design or develop drugs. They have to be lipophilic, but also water soluble. Then comes another thing. If we're gonna have a drug that kill a bacteria that we have got inside of our bodies, we, we, then, then it has to find that bacteria. And inside the bacteria is what we call a target that the compound has to reach, because it's gonna bind to the target and hopefully kill the bacteria or make sure it doesn't grow anymore. When we start trying to make something new, we can say we can look at what we call novel targets, targets that has not been used before to develop new antibiotics. However, the problem then is we don't really know very much about the target. And that means that things like toxic effects, it's a little bit sort of question mark, resistance, meaning that uh, the bacteria become resistant toward the drug. We don't know very much about that either. Bioavailability mean how easy it is to reach this target. It's also a question mark. So to go for novel targets, as we say, could be a big challenge. And usually the outcome of doing this is that we just get a few compounds that we surviving into the clinical development. When we start down here, we might start with 10,000 compounds. And when we end up here, we have a handful of compounds and most of, them, most of these will probably fail. If you do the other thing and say, well, we know about quite a few good targets for developing antibiotics. Sure, we could go for that. And then uh, we can say that that's good because then we can predict a lot of things. Uh, properties can be predicted, new interaction sites we can find. We, we can also look at how we can get around this, the thing with resistance. However, if we do that, there are, we can get many compounds, but they will usually fail and they're not new. They use a mechanism that is old, which will be a problem because then we have all these problems with resistance that you will hear more about later in this course and you probably have heard about already. So th there is some pros and cons for both these strategies. Then we have to know a thing about uh, our, the favorite thing to do for a medicinal chemist. Let's do what we call a structure activity relationship study. And what does that really mean? Well, imagine that the target I talked about is this glow. It's a plastic glow we use in the lab. And then the whole idea here is you want to find the hand that fit perfectly into this glow. So, you know, you see the easily that, oh, we need to have five fingers, but it's a question about the size of the fingers and all that sort of stuff to fit perfectly in here. And what this really means is that we make a compound, we test it, see how it fits in the glow, because maybe we don't know exactly how the glow looks, how long the finger should be, how wide the hand should be. But we test the compound, see what we get out of it. Based on that, we go back, design a new compound, test it again, and we continue in that circle. If we do that properly, we probably test several thousand compounds that way. 
So it's a very laborious thing to do. But that's actually how you develop drugs. Design it, synthesize it, test it. Start all over again, same cycle. Until you find a compound that bind or fill all the fingers of the gloves, it fits perfectly. Then you have your lead compound. So, what more do we have to think of then? Well, if you're going to have a useful drug, it has to do something with the, the, the problem. And if this is a bacteria, we like it will kill the bacteria or stop the bacteria from growing. That must be an absolute requisite. Now, to test that outside the body in a small petri dish or in a lab, it's very easy. But if you're going to test that on human beings, we have to think about all the stuff I showed you about. How is the compound absorbed? How is it distributed in the body? Does it manage to find its way to the target? Is it soluble enough? Do we see any toxic effect? And so on and so on. So that's quite tricky. Have appropriate pharmacokinetics properties. That means what the body does to the drug. That's metabolism. The problem is if the body breaks down the antibiotic to a toxic metabolism, it could be unhealthy for us and we could die. And of course, we don't want that. And the compound also has what we call appropriate pharmacodynamic properties. And that's what the drug do to the body, the opposite thing. And that basically means, is it toxic by itself? Does it interact with other things in our bodies? Bear in mind, the antibiotic should only interfere with bacteria, not with our cells. If I say like this, all drugs on the market, and I say 100% of them, have side effects due to this. It's only a question about dose. If you overdose on the drug you got from your doctor, you will get side effects just because of this. That's with all drugs. There are no drugs without side effects. It's only a question about dosing. So from this, you will probably think like, hmm, making a drug sounds pretty difficult. Yeah, it's really like finding a needle in a haystack. It's a big challenge. So what do we have today then of antibiotics? This here shows a slight overview of what's currently available. And you have to remember one thing now. Now I talk about antibiotic for systemic use. It means you take it as a tablet. It's distributed in your entire body. It's not something we have locally on the skin. That's different classes again. And you see, it's, it's quite a few of them. And then you see, I, I highlighted one. That's the yellow one down here. That's drugs only for tuberculosis. And tuberculosis is considered to be a different sort of piece of, you know, infections. A bit tricky to handle. Important thing now. This class, you see there are only two names here. It means that is very few drugs available to treat that. And then you might say, ah, tuberculosis, that's not a problem in Sweden at least. So we don't have to worry about that. Yeah, but then we have the problem. We travel. We travel to countries where tuberculosis is a problem. So you can get infected. And the second thing, quite recently some researchers have published a paper where they say that they think quite a number of the human population carry the bacteria around, but you don't get tuberculosis. It means that it's latent, it's lying there, just waiting to break out. If that's really true, this, this might be a big problem in the future. All the other ones here, that's uh, antibiotics for normal infections, not tuberculosis. And you see there are several subclasses. And I've drawn up the structure of four of them that we're going to look a little bit on to illustrate a few examples. The lower one here is a completely synthetic compound. Those three belong to this class, beta-lactams. They are semi-synthetic or natural products. 
most of the compounds you see here for all these drugs are mainly natural compounds. It's only this one, which is completely synthetic. So nature makes quite a few very useful antibiotics. What do these antibiotics do to the bacteria? Then? Well, this is a very schematic illustration of a bacteria. And then you see I have these uh, tablets here. One, two, three, four. And basically, more or less all the ones I had on my previous slide, they do one out of these four mechanisms, meaning they either interfere when we go from uh, or do replication transcription. Replication means copying the DNA. Transcription means we make mRNA. So that all works on the, on the nucleic acid level. We have some drugs that interfere with translation, how we convert mRNA to a protein. We have third class that do something with the cell wall in the bacteria. And the fourth class is it interfere with what we call essential metabolites. So take a message. There are four main mechanisms. That's how the majority of all antibiotics works. This is the quinolones, the completely synthetic ones I talked about. And you see basically down here, I, I've written what they usually do, the sort of very general mechanism of these. It's synthetic, and it, you can say it interferes with replication. That's the simple view of it. Then you can say, you see what is called R here. It means that it could be different types of things sitting there. And these things have a major impact on what this drug do. I just have a few slides to illustrate that for you. That functionality showed in, uh, in this circle is critical for activity. If I change that, I don't have an antibiotic anymore. In these R groups here, you see I, I've drawn out different types of functionalities. And it's not so important to remember exactly what it is, but it means what you have here have an impact on the activity. And basically what you see on this slide is what I call the structure activity relationship. You remember that picture, the glow and the hand? I want to find the hand that fit perfectly into the glow. That's basically what I've done here. And then you see that all these different functional groups, they have an impact on the activity. As soon as you see an arrow pointing upwards, it means increased activity. So having, for instance, this system sitting in this position, that increased activity towards what we call gram-positive bacteria, and so on. So it means by just varying what is sitting on that central core of the molecule, I get antibiotics that have different types of activity and activity towards different types of bacteria. So I can tune that. But then you remember, I talked also about, we have something called toxicity, meaning what sort of side effects could this drug give? What sort of other things could it interact with? And properties, pharmacokinetics, and again, if you look at these functional groups we have here, if R7 is what we call bulky, it means that it gets big. Side chain, half-life goes up. It means how long does the drug circulate in the bloodstream? If you think about that, is that important? Well, yes, it is. Because if it's out of the body too quickly, it won't find the bacteria. It does nothing. If it stays too long in the body, we're probably going to get side effects from it. So the half-life should be appropriate for whatever we want to achieve with the drug. So that's important. Then you also see something I call CNS penetration. CNS stands for central nervous system. 
if you have bacteria that are in your central nervous system, we need an antibiotic that can enter the central nervous system. And by increasing the size and the bulkiness here, we get more and more CNS penetration. So it's just to illustrate again, we can tune the properties of the drug, how it travels around the body. These other examples here, they, um, they illustrate similar things. But what you should remember from this is, these functional groups partly say something about the structure activity relationship. Some groups are really good for getting you know, high activity. And this also shows that the same groups is also responsible for toxicity, how it's distributed, physical properties of the drug. Then we have these beta lactams. And when I say type 3 here, that refer to that figure where I had four different mechanisms. And type 3 was those that interfere with the cell wall of the bacteria. So all these do the same sort of thing. They interfere with cell wall synthesis in the bacteria. And if you look at them, they, they look pretty similar because it's, all of them has this four member ring and then there's, here's a five member, six member, five member. So they little bit similar structures. Again, these R groups that are written here, that could be a lot of different groups. And again, these groups are important for how the drug acts, how it travels around, toxicity, what sort of bacteria it will attack, and potency, how effective it is. If you just use one of them as an example, then what I've written there is one, two, three, four functional groups. And you see most of them are described as essential. It means if I do any change in these positions, the activity just goes down. I kill the drug. It won't work anymore. So with this structure, it looks like I can hardly do any changes at all with it because then the activity will go down or vanish completely. This slide is just meant to illustrate. So why is the cell wall important for the bacteria? And if you think, um, if you go past a building site, you will see that when they use, make concrete to build a building, for instance, they put these iron bars in the concrete. And why do they do that? Well, it makes the wall much more solid. It makes it much stiffer. If you forget to put iron in it, the wall will start to crack after a while and you will get a hole in it. And if you think about that image and say, here we have the bacteria, we have a cell wall in the bacteria, and we have something called a peptidoglycan layer. It's just a big polymer. If you imagine that that part is the equivalent of having iron in the concrete, if I make hole in this, the cell wall will not be stable anymore. Inside the bacteria, the pressure is much higher than on the outside. So if this layer gets weakened enough, the bacteria will pop. It will be destroyed. And everything inside comes out. So these beta-lactam antibiotics, they weaken the peptide lactam layer. And the bacteria dies because we get holes in the cell wall. If you look at this in detail now, now there is no iron bars. But what I've drawn here, if you think about each circle, that's an amino acid, building blocks of all proteins. And then there is a sugar, and then it has a long tail. So this is very lipophilic. This is polar. And this is just an amino acid sequence. If you look carefully at this, you will see that there is a letter first, D, D, L, D, L. And that tells us what sort of amino acid it is, if it's of the D form or the L form. Now, the antibiotics I'm going to talk about, they interfere with this part of the molecule. And the way this is recognized, it's only because it's a mix of D and L in this sequence. Our cells in our body 
does not have a mix. We only have one type of amino acids, not L and D. That's how we receive specificity in this case. The antibiotic only interfere with this amino acid sequence because of the two types of amino acids sitting in it. If you think about this, this is an enzyme that the bacteria have. And it takes one of these building blocks. The square here now is this lower part here. These circles and the color code is illustrated here. And since these are amino acids, the way they are linked together is always this sort of functionality in between them. It's called an amide. Now, to stabilize the cell wall, the bacteria would like to do this, to make a bond between one of these chains to another chain. It's called cross-linking. And what happens is that this enzyme, it attacks here, get this intermediate, then this functional group here comes in, kick this out again, and I go to cross-linking. So it's a multi-step sort of synthesis of making cross-linking, stabilizing the cell wall. The thing with our antibiotics, the beta-lactams, is that this enzyme, of course an enzyme can't think, but imagine this. It recognizes the antibiotic as the spacing between two of these amino acids. So this enzyme, this is doing its job over here, it attacks it. And I get this as a result. That means that the antibiotic is now bound to the enzyme. If the antibiotic is bound to the enzyme, the enzyme can no longer continue stabilizing the cell wall. So I prevent the bacteria from renewing its cell wall. And eventually that will lead to that I get holes in the cell wall and the bacteria dies. That's the simplified version of how all beta lactams work. Among them, you find things like penicillins and cephalosporins that are probably among the most common antibiotics we have. Probably most of you have tried that at some point. It's quite common to get that when you have a light infection. Then comes the problem. This is another enzyme, but it's an enzyme that the bacteria produce itself. And that enzyme does only one thing. It recognizes antibiotics and cleaves them. So the bacteria has a defense mechanism, which is designed so that it actually destroys the antibiotics. That's not good because it means it kills the antibiotic before it can do its job. That the bacteria produce this is a part of resistance mechanisms. That's a big problem. A way we can avoid this is to think the following way. We have the antibiotic, and then we make sure that the antibiotic has a big R group here to make it bulky. Then this enzyme will not be able to come and see this amide bond and cleave it. So the antibiotic becomes much more stable towards the beta lactamases that the bacteria produce. Again, to figure out this was a result of structure activity relationship studies. You make a whole bunch of compounds, you test them and see what works. If you look at this, this is very similar structure. But now it's not a penicillin anymore, it's a cephalosporin. This you recognize as the enzyme that was doing the cross-linking of the peptidoglycan layer. And again, it recognized the cephalosporin as the bond between two amino acids in the peptidoglycan layer, attacks it, and we get this. And again, we trap the enzyme, the antibiotic is now attached 
to the peptide, uh, to, to the enzyme that is supposed to maintain the cell wall. Again, the result is we get hole in the cell wall, the bacteria die. And the last example I had was the this group, which looks pretty similar. The sort of core of the molecule is very similar to penicillins, just some small differences. But you see, those parts that are essential, that are important, is the double bond. If I take that away, I will kill the activity. It will be a much worse antibiotic. It looks a bit different over here compared to the penicillins. So it means that this have the same reaction mechanism as other compounds we just looked at, but it's slightly different structure on it. So it's a variation of the same thematic thing. The useful thing of this is that we can use them on what we call multi-drug resistant bacteria. Many people get bacteria infections of bacteria that are resistant to penicillins. But it's not as many bacteria that are resistant to this type of compounds. So this is some kind of the last resort. If nothing else works, we try this one. Then you see what we have. And the problem is that we have too many bacteria to start to get resistance towards these antibiotics. So we need new ones. So how do we go ahead and do that? Well, we can do the following. We can improve existing antibiotics. We can do more structure activity relationship to find something that can boost activity. But as we discussed earlier on, the problem is we'll get an antibiotic to have a similar reaction mechanism to those that we already have. And the risk that we get resistance is very high. So maybe not ideal, but possible. We can take all drugs that may, maybe have been used for other things and see if they have antibacterial activity. That's quite common to do today. Or we can see, can we find some new chemicals that have never been tested before? Could be from nature or we can synthesize something and see what happens. Target-based means that we know the reaction mechanism or how the target for our drug look like. So we can design something that will do the job exactly. High precision drugs, if you like. And this last one, rediscover old antibiotics. We can test things that has been testing in the past because we have better methods today and see, hmm, maybe there will be an opportunity to develop these things into better drugs. I'm just going to show you a few examples. This stuff here, it looks like a very big molecule. It's a natural product. It's called vancomycin. It's also one of these super potent antibiotics. So if nothing else works, this is what we use. If you look here, this is basically the same structure, but in the red boxes, what I've shown is that we have modified the whole structure. To have two rings like this, it's just a lipophilic handle. It inhibits transpeptidases and cell wall biosynthesis in a more efficient way. If we change one of these carbonyls and just remove the oxygen, we get something that has better activity. And if we have something like this, if you look careful now, I have a charge here, meaning that this compound will be very water soluble. Transportation is very efficient. But it also partly helps to reduce cell membrane permeability. So this is an optimized version of vancomycin. We start with the old drug, we optimize it, get a better drug. This is a completely new one that was isolated from um, um, a microorganism. If you look careful on it, it looks like there is something that could reassemble a peptide, some amino acids, and a nucleoside, the building blocks we have in RNA and DNA. This have a unique activity. 
discovered by serendipity. But it's, it's pretty potent. I'm going to think that this might be a new thing that we could bring on the market. And as far as I know, this is the last sort of thing that has been discovered that seems to be super potent. It's a peptide, a cyclic one, because you have a cyclic structure here. It inhibits cell wall synthesis. The mechanism for doing this is unique. It's not the same as the beta lactams. And again, the reason why they discovered this was that somebody came up with a very smart way to grow microorganisms in the lab. Then they managed to grow enough of the microorganism and isolate this from this microorganism. And it turns out to be really, really potent. But if we just look quickly at this submarine island, one thing you can think of is, let's say that uh, all antibiotics suddenly stop working. We don't have anything like that. Is that a problem? Well, if you think a little bit about like, if you're a patient that need a new kidney or a new liver or something like that, it will be almost impossible to have that kind of operations if you don't have antibiotics because we have to prevent the infections from doing the operation. It's one aspect. To move your appendix will probably be a major challenge. I mean, today we think about it, ah, it's nothing. It's a very quick operation. But if you don't have antibiotics to kill bacteria infection that might you know, come into the wound, etc., probably quite a few people will die of that. I think it's like, you know, this would become a, a killer disease. I mean, today we say, nah, well, we just treat a little bit of antibiotics, no problem. But that will not be the case anymore if we don't have anything that works. Gonorrhea will become extremely difficult to treat. And uh, tuberculosis, as we mentioned earlier today, too, it's, it's the same. So... A world without antibiotics is quite difficult to imagine. Things that we today take for granted will be a major health problem. So based on that, which I hope is a take home message, a part of this would be that we need to have new antibiotics. And these new antibiotics, they need to have novel mechanisms, not just copies of what we had in the past, but they have to really make a difference. Otherwise, we have no use for them really. And if we say that this is important to develop, well, then we need medicinal chemists or scientists that can help developing this, testing this, so we can bring forward new antibiotics for treatment of all sorts of infectious diseases. And that's really a key thing. So usually since I'm teaching that subject, I would say that if you want to make a difference, it's not a bad thing to become a chemist because you can contribute to improving life of many people. Same with biology too. It's really a big, big challenge. And it's completely underestimated the, the, the sort of scope of this and what we really have to do. Good. Thanks. If, if, I'm, if I'm going to be in my optimistic mood, I would say that uh, I think there are quite a few things that are in the pipeline. That looks good. I think the, the last number I've seen, there is something in the order of 35 to 40 compounds in advanced clinical trials that are all what we call new antibiotics. That sounds good. The problem is that most of these are just reiterations of old drugs. We modify them a little bit, so probably won't help in the long run. If I'm going to be more negative and think, uh, or maybe realistic would be a more a better word, <coughs> I would say that I wouldn't say we're screwed, but <laughs> pretty close to it. And, and the, there, there might be many reasons for this. It's, it's not one simple answer to this. But one thing you can think of, the pharma industry that is supposed to provide the drugs is mainly there to make cash. It's not run because it's important to, to bring improved health, but they have to earn money from it. And if you think a little bit about it, those antibiotics we have are absolutely awesome drugs. 
Because what you do, you get an infection, you go to the doctor, and the doctor say, take this for 10 days, and then you have solved the problem. When the antibiotic is working, of course. 10 days. And if you think about that, okay, the pharma industry produced a drug, the patient takes it for 10 days, and that's it. But it's not much money to earn on that. If you think like, if another patient comes and say, you know, they have a disease, so you have to go on the drug for the rest of your life, then we're talking big money. So one important thing has been that the pharma industry realized this many years ago, that there is no really big money to earn in, in antibiotics. So we're not going to give that high priority. That's one issue. So, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, it will be a challenge. So th then we have the other aspect that is quite interesting. So if you go back 10 years ago, or maybe a little bit more, the, the, everybody was saying, you need to be a big company with you know, awesome, a lot of money in order to develop any drugs because it's a, a major effort and it costs absolutely ridiculous sums of money to do it. Just to illustrate that, to take one drug from the development all the way to the market, you talk about billions, and you know you need a massive workforce to do it, and so on and so on. That has changed over the, the last 10 years, because suddenly there are non-commercial companies that's running based on academic groups and so on. That's someone saying, ha, huh, we, we can do parts of this. We can, maybe we can't do the whole thing. And People like Bill Gates, who've been shuffling money into, for instance, anti-malaria projects and so on, really makes a huge difference. And suddenly you will see that there's a lot of academic groups that are involved in drug development, but they can't maybe do the whole lot. But it seems to be a completely different field today. And you also see it because the pharma industry today is much more keen on collaborating with academic groups. So from that perspective, it, I think it's, it looks much more healthy today. And there is also uh, much more ideas about we shouldn't only do this for earning money. I mean, drug industry is, you know, you can really make a lot of money if you're involved in that. But suddenly people say, no, we need to do it because we have to take care of humanity. So this is change in attitude, change in how things uh, are working and how, how you organize things. I think there is good hope that some of these will successfully bring something to the market. I can tell you here in Sweden, there is a, a EU consortium. It's, it's run from Uppsala. Some years back, they got 700 millions to develop one new antibiotic. And as far as I know, they're, they're, they're getting pretty close to getting something into the clinic that seems to be doing okay. And that's a joint sort of uh, investment from the EU and from some private companies and other sort of foundations. So sure, there is possibilities, but we probably need much more of it in order to speed up things.